Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergera.com. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Y'all, we are so excited. As many of you know, we took our first fruits offering and I'm emotional. Um, Matthew and I started this thing four years ago, almost four years ago, and it's been crazy. We've seen a lot of crazy things happen. Ethan, who's visiting this morning, whom we love so much, who also loves being put on the spot, was a part of this very early on. Jasmine was there from the very beginning. Like We have some people who have been with us through some crazy, crazy stuff. And I just want to say that when we asked y'all to pray over the first fruits offering, there were some people who gave crazy stuff, and there were some people who gave little stuff. And every single one of those gifts, no matter the size, was a tremendous, tremendous blessing. When we set out to, to do this, knowing that financially we need the support here at TakeOver, we really prayed for a number. And it didn't seem too dramatic to me, but I was just praying, God, please let us hit this number. And, and he did some crazy stuff. And Matt's going to Matt's gonna tell you that a little bit more about that. But I just want to say nothing was wasted. Every single gift that came in was just absolutely incredible. So thank you, thank you, thank you all from the bottom of our hearts. Yeah, absolutely. And the incredible thing about, um, about year-end giving or year-beginning givings and things like that, like, if you don't know how our God works yet, there's one area in which he says, test me. And it's not in uh, purity, and it's not in your political favor, and it's not in anything but finances. Finance is the only time that you hear him say, test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not blow open the floodgates of heaven. And friends, I got to tell you, for a four-year-old church plant that started with $80, the Lord blew open the floodgates of heaven, and what we raised was, yeah, we can come on, you can. Seriously, you have no idea. So yeah, we, were, uh, we went through the first, we gave the Lord the first of the year. We had worship nights. We asked everybody to fast. We asked you to pray. We didn't even tell you to give. That's the funny part about it. I was talking to somebody, and he was like, yeah, you didn't even tell us to give. You just asked us to let the Lord decide. And I was like, right, as it should be. Like, hey, talk to your father. What does he put on the inside of you? And let's go with that number. Don't listen to me. You know, listen to the Lord. And uh, I kid you not, Adrian and I were talking, and we were like, what, what, what is realistic? What, what's a possibility? And I just threw a dart in the dark, and it was just like, yeah, you know what? I think we could potentially get $5,000, and that would really help lay a really strong foundation for, like, the rest of the year financially, yeah. which is nuts, okay? And what the Lord did is what he always does when people are faithful. Come on, how many of you guys know you never come last when you put God first? That's just the reality of who he is. He takes you along with him into first place. That is what he does with us. And what he did was exceed Ephesians 3.20. Our God is able to do exceedingly above all that we could ask, dream, or imagine according to the work of the Holy Spirit that is at work in you. And guys, I got a drum roll. I don't got no drum rolls. No drum, no drum rolls. rolls. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay, there we Come go. On, and what we got. <laughs> and what we got, what you gave, what you laid a foundation for, what the Lord told you to be faithful with was not 5,000, not 6,000, not 7,000, not 8,000, not 9,000, not even 10,000. Come on, somebody. You gave. $10,310.35. Not sorry, because I clean this place up tomorrow. But friends, it was amazing. And honestly, I got to tell you, church planning is the most difficult thing uh, I think could ever happen. And if you look at the Apostle Paul and all the New Testament um, church plants and things like that. It was just full of betrayal and daggers and heresy and crazy things. And I got to tell you, we've experienced some of that in the four years. But what eclipses the problems, the people, the situations is y'all. Yeah. 
what eclipses that is your faithfulness to this house. It's not your faithfulness to Pastor Matt or Pastor Adrienne. It's not your faithfulness to the idea or institution of church. It is to what Jesus set up to build and said the gates of hell would not prevail against it. This is about your heart for your father and what he wants to do in the earth through Takeover Church. So please, can we just give it up for you guys? I just want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts with everything in me. I, I got to tell you, I was, I was crying all week because it just kept, it didn't stop on Sunday. It kept pouring in. And I know there was some people who asked if we could leave it open because they were figuring out finances and stuff. And so this isn't just a last minute plea. This is, if you go to our website, takeovergr.com, underneath give, there's a general fund, which is normal tithes and offerings. And then there's a first fruits offering. And if you still want to take part in that, feel free. We love it. God loves it. But aside from that, you guys gave $10,310.35. Praise God. Come on, somebody. Praise God. That's amazing. That is amazing. My mind is blown and my heart is humbled. And I just honestly, like, I don't want to be a grown man crying up here in front of you. But you have no idea. You have no idea what that does, not only for this church financially for the rest of the year, but bless you. But what this does for Adrian and I as your pastors and, and some of the battles that we've had. So I just want to say thank you for being faithful. And I also want to say this. Man, I've seen it time and time again in my own life and the lives of others. And this is not hyperbole and this is not pastor talk, okay? Legitimately, when we partner with what God is doing, he will partner with what he has us doing. And just watch on the back side of this. You, you aren't going without for a reason. You're going with. You're going with, you're not going without, you're going with. And with is where the Lord is going, what he is doing. And I promise you, this is not some prosperity gospel. This is just our father. Jesus said it himself. He loves to give good gifts to his children. And our father loves a cheerful giver. Amen. All right, you guys mind if I preach a little bit? Come on, somebody. All right, let me get out of my emotional bag and get back into my other emotional bag. Ugh. Get ready. Okay, so this morning, we are kicking off a brand new series called Agreements. Can we throw that graphic up there, Killer Kells? Oh, yeah. How cool is that graphic, by the way? I'm going to go get a tattoo ASAP of that, okay, on my neck. Uh, no, probably not. Probably not my neck, but I want that, okay? We're starting a message series called Agreements, and, and, and the reason why is because, friends, I have a word to start off the rest of this year with for you. Let me tell you this. Let me encourage you with this. <laughs> happens. Let me challenge you with this. Friends, you are not the sum total of the actions that you make. You're not. You are not the sum total of the inactions that you don't take. You and I, we are the sum total, not of the feelings that we feel, None of the thoughts that we have or don't have, you and I, we are the sum total of the agreements that we make. You see, as Christians, you got to understand this. Your relationship with Jesus, your calling in this earth, what you were made to do, your relationship with your spouse or with your friends or with your community, with everything, what God has placed you on this earth to do, everything, everything comes from a place of agreement. You will either live in the most amount of freedom underneath Jesus that you will ever live in your entire existence here on this side of heaven based off your agreements with the word of God, with him, with the Holy Spirit, with God, with Jesus. Or you and I, we will live in the single most amount of bondage, chains that we have ever experienced in this earth on this side of heaven again based solely off what agreements you and I choose to make with our lives. Friends, our agreements, they proceed, or they supersede rather, everything that you and I do in our lives. So it's my charge. As we go into this series, I'm gonna leave a lot of stuff kind of vague at the moment because we got some fun stuff planned, but we're going after agreements. We are going after agreements because we live in a time or place right now that honestly, we have a church, not just our church, I'm talking about the church. I love the Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ is my favorite. She has some messy history. We've done some bad things. We have, you know what I'm saying? We all know what I'm talking about. There's been some things, okay? But I love her. 
because Jesus loves her. And you can't be friends with Matt if you don't want to be friends with my wife. Hear me. And you can't be friends with Jesus if you're not friends with his wife. I love the bride. And it is high tide that we decided we are going to break some agreements that we have with the world, some agreements that we have with some religious spirits, breaking awesome agreements, being set free, and we are going to live a liberated people here and now. Amen? All right. Sales pitch. Title of my message this morning, if you're taking notes, where my note takers at? AKA my favorite people. Hello. Hello. Favor ain't fair? Note takes. Okay. Title of my message is Eyes and Lies. Eyes and lies. It's provocative. It gets the people going. Someone's like, hey, what's it mean? Oh, stop, stop. We got a lot of scripture to get to. Y'all love your Bibles? Yeah. Who loves their B-I-B-L-E? Come on, somebody. Here we go. We're coming out of Judges. Oh, somebody say Old Testament. O-T. All right, it's going to be up on the Sky Bible. Hey, give it up for who we got back there. We got DJ, we got Michael, we got Kelsey in the booth. Give it up for them holding it down. Come on. Come on. They make everything that we do up here look actually impressive. Like, it's fantastic. Judges 16, 4 through 22. Here we go. Ready? It's a bit of scripture. We're going to breeze through it, though, okay? Get ready. After this, talk about Sam, uh, Samson. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies. Don't worry, I got more singing coming later. And by what, <laughs> by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him, and we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. You ain't got nothing on takeover church, fam. So Delilah said, so Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound, that one could subdue you. And Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings. Anybody else picture Samson looking like Kevin Sorbo from Hercules in the 90s? I do. Me and Mike alone. We got this. Old guys unite. Please tell me where we get your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried yet, then I shall become weak like any other man. Then the Lord of the, of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound with him. She bound him with them. There we go. Now she had been lying in ambush in an inner chamber, and she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as a thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire. Yep. So the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak, just like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes, bound him with them, said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And then men lying in ambush were in an inner chamber, but he snapped the ropes off his arms, just like a thread. Verse 13. Then Delilah said, Samson, until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. Come on, girl. And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with a pin, then I shall become weak and be like any other man, a.k.a. women. Stay away from dudes with top knots. They weak. Oh, bro. My bad. I was more aiming for Zach, um, but Calvin could actually beat me in a fight, so I retract my previous statement. Uh, don't kill me. The dude just took gold and some jiu-jitsu bending and breaking fools this weekend. Like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm finna die. Oh, here we go. Anyways, so while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head, wove them into a web, and he made them tight with a pin and said to him, the top knot looks great. The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pin, oh, Lord, the loom and the web. And he said to him, how can you say, I, she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she expressed hard to him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. Men, stay away from women that vex you to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me. I shall become weak like any other man. And when Delilah said... 
When Delilah saw that he had told her all that was in his heart, she sent and called for the Lord of the Philistines and said, Come again, for he has told me all of his heart. Then the Lord of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her lap. And she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as any other time and I will shake myself free. But he did not know that his strength had left him and that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after he had been shaved. So we're going to pray. That was a lot of scripture, but I promise we're going to have a good time with it. Sound good? Amen. Calvin, don't kill me. So we're going to pray uh, for mercy and uh, guidance. Sound good? Fantastic. Father God, we just thank you so much for today. God, we ask that right now you would do exceedingly above all that we could ask, dream, or imagine. Father God, right now we just lift up the Holy Spirit. We say, Holy Spirit, come. Father, we know that you are omnipresent. We know that you are here. We also know where your word says that two or more gather in your name. There you are in the midst of us. So Holy Spirit, come and move in the midst of us. Any other spirit in this place, spirit of depression, spirit of suicide, spirit of self-doubt, self-hate, spirit of disbelief, spirit of fear, Right now, we just say you bow to the mighty name of Jesus. You go back to hell and to the accuser from which you came. And Holy Spirit, please overtake those spaces and places within our hearts and our minds, God, that were previously occupied by lesser spirits and lesser authorities. So come and have your way. Father God, break off the agreements in our lives that are not of you. Show us the agreements that are of you. And come and rule and reign in our lives once again. A faith-filled, bold, audacious, wild, crazy, mad, falling out of the tree in love with Jesus. Church said? Amen. Oh, that doesn't sound like you crazy. You said? Amen. There we go. Come on, somebody. All right. Eyes and lies. Eyes and lies. Let's get here. Okay. So, I love this portion of scripture. Okay. Samson is like... Top five dudes in the Bible for me, okay? I've been waiting to preach this message, okay? Like, well, I didn't have the message because the Lord just gives me new stuff. But, like, I've been waiting to preach on this, and I have not preached on Samson and Delilah in the entire history of Takeover Church. Like, it's nuts. And, and, and I'm really pumped because this is one of my favorite things. Like, Samson, Samson's a man. You know what I'm saying? Samson is buck wild. Samson is a Nazarite, which means that he took, he's a Jewish man, who took a vow from birth, okay, that he would not shave his head, that he would not have any wine or grapes, and also, which is really strange, um, he wouldn't associate with dead or touch corpse, which is like, so you just kill fools and then just run away, like, (laughs) right on. It's called a drive-by in my neighborhood. Anyways, um, So, uh, it's too real. I live on Oakdale. Anyways, so, back on subject. This is why people hate me and love me, I hope. Um, But Samson, he's a man. He is awesome. Samson, not only has he just, is, is he known for this story, but check this out real quick. Samson is a man who legitimately killed a lion with his bare hands. Ladies, what more do you want? You know what I'm saying? Not only that, he killed an entire Philistine army with the jawbone of a donkey. We all thought David was cool with his little rocks. Samson's out here like, yo, I found this donkey jawbone, and I'm just going to wreck fools, okay? He also, you know, uh, some weird things happened in his life, like uh, collecting, you know, foreskins for weddings and stuff. That's strange, you know? But it, it, It was a different time. It's a different time. What a time to be alive. But going back to it, if you were to ask Matt, if you were to ask young Matt McClure, comes to know Jesus, 16 years old, and you're like, hey, Matt, uh, what do you want to, you know, like, who do you want to be when you grow up? I would have been like Jesus, John Dutton, and Samson, okay? 
if you know, you know, all right? Jesus, John Dutton, and Samson. So Samson is just the absolute man, and I love him. I love his whole story. We're going to get to this, but, but you got to understand, in order to do Samson justice, in order to do the word of God justice, in order to tell this story, Samson's story doesn't actually begin with Samson. It might end with Samson, but it doesn't begin with Samson. You see, Samson's story begins with his mother and his father. You see, there's this crazy thing that happens where Samson's mother, an angel of the Lord, comes and visits her and her husband. And all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord says, you are going to bear a son. You are going to have a son. He shall be a Nazarite all his life. You shall raise him in the ways of being a Nazarite. And because you do this, I will not only give you a son, but I will use him in mighty ways for my glory. And we have to sit right here for a minute because this is the moment that changes everything. This is the moment where our obedience and our faith collide. How crazy are you willing to get when the Lord gives you a word? Because for Samson's mother, she chose to believe the word of the Lord over the word of her own body. She was marked barren. She was told, you can have no kids. No children shall come for you. She probably lived in shame given the time because what good at that time is a woman aside from having children, siring a son, and continuing on the family estate. It was just how the world was at the time. What is your place? What do you do? Who even are you? What else are you good for? And so she takes years of shame, mockery, being pushed off, disregarded, and discarded by society. And the word from the Lord comes to her, and he says, you may be barren, but I will give you a son. And friends, I think this is a word for all of us in 2022. Some of us, let me challenge you real quick. Let me just be your pastor for a second and not just a comedian up here, okay? Some of us, We need to start trusting the word of the Lord over the word of our own body. Can I just say that? Like, we need to start trusting the word of the Lord over the word of our own body. I have seen in the last two years, man, I really wish you would get off this. I would get off it if I saw the church stop allowing fear, COVID, sickness, and all these things to rule and reign in our lives the only way the throne of Jesus is called to do. Man, I just wish you'd get off this, and I just wish we would be free. I just wish we would stop listening to the word of our bodies, to the word of fear, to the word of just paranoia and all of these things. I'm not saying be unwise. I'm saying have faith. You and I, friends, we are not called to live another two years paralyzed by fear, paralyzed paralyzed by flu, by covid I'm sorry. Adrian said it earlier. We're sick of the C word. Why? Because there's a greater C word. There's a capital C word. His name is Christ, and he still rules and reigns in heaven. You know who doesn't rule and reign on heaven? COVID. You know who's not the bread of life? Dr. Fauci. I'm, I'm not sorry. We're the church. Friends, you and I, what could God do in your life if you started listening to the word of the Lord over the word of your own body, what if when you got sick, hear me, what if when you got sick, whether it was COVID, flu, cold, I don't care. From the mildest cold to the craziest of cancers and things like that, what, would the, what could the Lord do in your life if instead of going to Google, instead of going to the latest news thing, instead of going on Twitter, instead of going on social media, instead of texting the person who in your life both conveniently knows the most about sickness and is the most fear-driven person you know, instead of doing that, what if you woke up and you were just like, dude, I feel like crap. Isaiah 535, God says that he was pierced for my transgressions, he was bruised for my decree, and it was by his stripes on his back on the cross that he bore all my sickness. And by his stripes I am healed in Jesus' mighty name. What if we began to actually take Christianity serious. What if we decided that as a body in Grand Rapids, we want to see revival here. Let's have it revive here, okay? Because friends, we've been paralyzed by fear for two years. I've seen more Christians paralyzed by fear than I have seen them revived by faith in the last two years. 
this is the hill I'm going to die on. I'm not saying sickness isn't serious. It's just not as serious as Jesus. 100%. I'm not saying that it's not powerful. It's just not as powerful as Jesus. I'm not saying that it hasn't swept the world, but it's not omnipresent like Jesus. You know what I'm saying? That's who we are. We are a people that are going to believe the word of the Lord over the word of our own bodies. I mean, check it. Samson's mother. What could God birth in your life? What could God birth through your life? What could God do in your marriage? What could God do in your finances? What could God do through you and your spiritual giftings? What could God do in your ministry? What could God do in your workplace and your friendships and your whole network? What could the Lord begin to do in and through you if you decided, no, 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 fear, you don't get to rule me. Sickness, you don't get to rule me. Come on, am I preaching to anybody this morning? I got one more thing I wanna say on that topic. If I hear, if I hear another Christian say to me, Matt, the church should be a hospital for the broken. But that same Christian does not come around when they're sick, does not call up a friend to come over and pray, does not get in the chat and lift up faith, does not go to the word of God before they go to anything else. If they don't say, hey, I'll come up in the upper room and I'll rest up there during service. I'll even stay away from everybody else. But I know that where his presence is, there his power is. Where believers are, there's authority. I'm going to come and I'm going to see myself healed, whole, set apart. I'm after the kind of faith that says, yo, I'm going to bring an at-home test with me and it's going to be negative by the end of service. That's the faith I'm coming after. Don't tell me we're a hospital for the broken and not believe for healing. Because, friends, the brokenness that Jesus went to the cross for, it doesn't begin and end with our heart and our emotional wounds. Those are real and those stunt and those paralyze and those will harm you and hold you back. Absolutely. But, man, I'm after a church. I'm after a faith. I'm after a revival in this land that says, come whatever may. I have one authority for my life, and it's the word of the Lord, not the word of my body or anybody else's. Look at this. Through one act of obedience, if you will raise him a Nazarite, I will take you from being barren to boring a son. And that son is not just some dork. That son isn't just some random person. The son isn't going to be found on the fields like David playing a harp. Okay, this son, taking down lions with his bare hands, doing the Lord's work, taking down Philistines and people who are literally just set up as, 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 as pillars to stand against God. And he'll do it, I don't know, with a donkey's jawbone just to make a statement. That's who our God is. What kind of statement, what kind of, what kind of trail could he blaze through your life of revival if you decided I'm not going to make agreements with my body, I'm going to make agreements with my God? This is about agreements, friends. Come on. Who's going to have the authority? Who are you going to partner with? Fear? I've been told before, Matt, we just want you to you know, be, have a little empathy and just like, it would make us feel better if we felt like you empathized with where I'm coming from. Friends, I get that that's a big word in society right now, empathy, but I got a word for you. It's never loving to partner with fear. It's never loving to partner with fear. And friends, I care far more about your healing than I do your feelings. I care far more about your faith than I do your fears. And that is the kind of church that you want to be a part of because we are going to stand here and we are going to stay here and we are going to break agreements that we've made with the world and culture and we are going to strengthen the agreements that we have with God. That is who we are. Amen? Amen. So Samson's a Nazarite. He's got no hair or he's got hair. He can't shave his hair. Can't drink no wine. Can't have no grapes. Not supposed to touch dead bodies. That last one is definitely easy. And here he is. And Samson 
we see this moment begin. And this moment is awesome, but this moment's kind of crazy real quick, if we can talk about it. Because Samson, he just returns from battle. In this moment, before he sees Delilah, Delilah, he see, before he sees her, I need some levity, okay? Before he sees Delilah, he comes home from just murking all of these Philistines, just going through and wrecking shop, okay? Doing his thing, battling for the Lord, establishing the Lord's command in all these different areas. He does his thing, he's doing his God-given duty, and he comes back to find that his father-in-law has sold off his wife to not just another man, but the best man in his wedding. Ain't that some stuff? You get back from doing what God has put you on this earth to do, and your father-in-law sells off, (laughs) my mind's here, and your father-in-law sells off your wife to your best mate, to your best friend, to your homie who stood up with you and was like, yep, I support this union until he's gone. Mr. Steal, your girl is behind you with a knife. Isn't that crazy? Here's Samson, broken, beaten, tired, has got to be weary from his travels and his battles. And he comes back to find that his father-in-law has sold off his bride to his best friend. You know, I don't even know why they call them in-laws. Really, they should be called outlaws because outlaws are actually wanted. That's a word. But mine are outlaws because I love my in-laws, okay? Don't kill me. Don't kill me, okay? You and you, I'm watching. I'm fast. I'm small. Anyways, not fast. My boot's broken. Um, But needless to say, This all happens as soon as Samson gets back from battle. This is supposed to be reprieve. This is supposed to be the end of a hard season. This is supposed to be the moment where things get back to normal. Remember that? When we thought things would get back to normal? Like, this is supposed to be that time. And he's supposed to come back, find his wife, have a brewski, sit down with the boys, talk about the battles, get some medals, looks like Star Wars, Chewie's there. It's awesome. Okay? But that's not what happens. Instead, what he finds is that his marriage has been ransacked, that the people he loved closest to him actively worked against him while he was gone. And he gets back, and this is the place that he finds himself in. And friends, can I tell you there's something absolutely encouraging about that? Pastor Matt, can you run that by me one more time? That's absolutely encouraging. Want to know why? Because Samson's a Nazarite. Samson is consecrated. Samson is called to be set apart, to live a life, not just uh, apart from the crowd, but set apart for the Lord. There is a difference, by the way. Anti-establishment, that's all good and well. You can do your thing, chicken wing, but just being outside of the crowd actually isn't living for the Lord. There is a difference. Consecration, being set apart, is Samson's identity. And he has battled as a Nazarite, he's lived as a Nazarite, he's won as a Nazarite, and right now he is being stolen from as a Nazarite. And friends, can I tell you, there is something very encouraging about that. Because friends, we know the devil's playbook, don't we? The enemy comes, John 10, 10, to steal, to kill, and destroy. Friends, could I tell you and maybe challenge you and submit to you today that if the devil isn't stealing from you, maybe you're not living set apart? Could I just tell you today that if the devil isn't trying to kill you, perhaps you aren't living a consecrated life? Could I challenge today? Thief comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. If he's not trying to destroy you, if you don't have a target on your back, perhaps then, friends, maybe we're just playing church and we're not being the church you see because the next part of that verse in john 10 10 is that jesus comes to give life and life to the full which would imply that you are living with jesus and life and life to the full you see the devil isn't going to steal from somebody who's not a non-issue from somebody who's not even on the board someone who's not even in the game he has no he has no issue with the world the world is already doing what they want what he wants them to do with living away from jesus He has his eyes set on you. He has his eyes set on me. And if he is not trying to rob you, ransack you, kill you, destroy you, and take from you, then perhaps we need to take some evaluation and go, am I living as set apart as the Lord has called me to? Am I preaching to anybody this morning? I love vacuum cleaners. Fantastic. 
because you can bring it in here anytime. So what happens next is this. Samson, wife is stolen. Father-in-law betrayed him. Came back from battle. He's tired. And all of a sudden, eyes and lies. The reason I called this message eyes and lies is because how many of you know you can't always control what's set before your eyes, but you can always control what you believe about what's set before your eyes. Right? Like you may, not, you may not be able to control what just comes in your purview, what moves from peripheral to peripheral, what moves from here to here, what comes in front of you. You can't always control that. You can't always object to that. You can't always stop something, someone, or culture, or movement, or the world just moving into your direct vision. But what you can do is choose what you believe about what's in front of your eyes. Eyes and eyes lies. And so here's Samson. And again, I'm going to keep going back to it because he's tired, he's beaten, he's broken. And all of a sudden, there's Delilah. And she was hot. And she was seductive. And she looked good. And obviously, we know from the scripture, she was easy. And Samson I'm just telling you what the Bible says, okay? Like, don't get mad at me. And Samson, he sees her, and he's looking, and he's liking. He is in a place as a Nazarite, lives set apart, consecrated for the Lord, set away from all of the rest of his culture and world. He is called to live higher. It's in this moment that something moves in front of his eyes. He sees a woman that captures his eyes and his heart and his feelings and his everything and he sees her and it's at this moment he makes a decision a conscious decision to pursue a woman that is not his wife because make no mistake about it that woman that he was married to first I don't give a rip that's his wife I don't care in God's eyes that's his wife there's only one out okay, in marriage, and that's not even God's desire. I'm sick and tired of marriage and divorce just being watered down in the church, okay? That's your wife. Amen? Amen. Come on. This is for life, fam. So it's not just that he chooses to do that, but instead what Samson does in this moment is he makes an agreement. He makes an agreement with what, you know, he's called not to associate with death, but this woman, obviously based off what we just read, This girl's death incarnate, okay? Like she is death incarnate, but he is here for it. And I gotta wonder, would he make the same decisions if he wasn't tired, if he wasn't beaten, if he wasn't coming back from battle, if he was fresh, if he didn't just have his heart broken and his wife stolen and betrayed by his father-in-law and his best friend, would he choose to go to the same pub at the same time in the same place and see Delilah? Would that happen? But that's not the reality that we live in. The reality we live in is that in those moments, how he was feeling, how broken he was, he saw what he saw. It was seductive. It got his attention. It was hot. It was promising. And it looked like something that would fulfill and, and what do you call it, like quench whatever hurt and harm he's feeling. Delilah. And I wonder about us. I wonder about me. What things do I begin to make agreements with that I never would if I was sober-minded? What things and cultures and movements and ideas and notions, my own heart, my own feelings, what thoughts enter my head would I not make agreements with if I was in prime condition, if I was as built up in the Lord as I should be, if I was in community being open, honest, and transparent and teachable, if I was actually just willing to do this thing called following Jesus to the best extent that I could, being empowered by the Holy Spirit and surrounded by community, if I was as built up, complete, lacking nothing as I possibly could be this side of heaven would I make these same agreements so what about us what agreements do we choose to make when we're broken when we're betrayed when we're in pain 
Because here's the deal. If we're going to break agreements, we're going to look out for the bear traps. You see, there's this thing called following Jesus. And we need to be putting our feet where he puts his feet and not our feet where we want to put our feet. Because Jesus knows the way through the landmines. Jesus knows the way through the bear traps. Jesus knows the way in which he is leading us. Doesn't mean there's not going to be attacks. It's what the devil does. It's what enemy does. It's what culture does. Always coming after the church. Always coming after you. But Jesus has lit up your path and he knows where you should be stepping. The second we decide, I know better on where to step than Jesus does, I would say that's a surefire surefire signal that you are not as built up and complete as you should be in this moment. I'm not preaching to anybody this morning. What decisions and agreements do you make when you're in pain, when you're hurt, when you're confused, when the world is going to hell in a handbasket, everything's been shut down for two years, when you're ridden by fear? What decisions do you begin to make? What crosses your eyes? What comes up on your computer screen? What comes up in conversations with your spouse? What happens that you say, yeah, that looks like it feels good? I know she's not my spouse, but she'll do. I know that's not how God says to live my life, but you know what? They dealt the first blow. They gossiped about me first, and this just felt good to get this off my chest. Gossip is still gossip, even if you're just trying to get it off your chest. Oh, well, you know what? The church just needs to catch up because, you know, the rest of the world is on it, and this is going to make me feel good. And we begin to make agreements out of broken, beaten, tired, betrayed, and weary places. Friends, this is what the devil does. Here's the bear trap. He wants nothing more than to lure you into a compromised place where you go from being set apart, consecrated, to not, well, to be compromised, consecrated to compromise. That is his goal. However he has to lure you, hook, line, and sinner, he will take you from being consecrated Nazarite to being a compromised Christian in 2022. That's his goal. And so what happens is Samson makes an agreement with Delilah. He actually enters a relationship with her. I mean, what else? What else is a relationship besides an agreement? What else is a relationship besides an agreement? I love you. You lie to me. I want to spend the rest of my life with you because I'm hurt and broken. I can't make very good decisions for myself. And you accept all major credit cards and cryptocurrency. That's a good one. And the Philistine lords knew it. Samson This mighty man, Nazarite, his name is famous. He is an absolute monster for the Lord, Jehovah Jireh. He is a monster for the kingdom of heaven that stands against us. He is brute force for the Lord in the earth. And we got to stop this guy. And he is into this girl who is a known prostitute. And she's for hire. And so what ends up happening here is the classic story. And Samson sees her and he's like, hey there, Delilah, what's it like being so pretty? I've been out killing all the armies and now I'm getting really dirty. Yes, I am. I'd give up all I am for you. You know it's true. Hey there, Delilah, what's... Where did you get those shears? Because I woke up on the criterias, but now I have no eyes. Anyways, I lost it. I lost the plot. I thought you'd be my bride, but you took too much off the sides. It's true. I don't know what to do. Anyways, we all know the song. Hey there, Delilah. We know it. And he sees her, and he sings it, and he's like, this is the one. This is what's going to replace everything. This is something I can agree to. And what he doesn't know is that what's before his eyes is masquerading a lie. And he doesn't know because he's broken, because he's defeated, because he's gone through a long period of time, and he is just like, this is going to scratch all the itches, make me feel so much better. You complete me. It's a thing. 
But what Samson doesn't know is what he just made an agreement with. And friends, can I just tell you, every agreement will cost you something. Every agreement you make will cost you something. It will either cost you the heavenly in exchange for the earthly, or it will cost you the earthly in exchange for the heavenly. What do you want? Do you want to live in power or do you want to live in paralysis? Do you want to live in power or do you want to live in paralysis? What do you want in your life? Because the agreements that you make will either exchange the heavenly call on your life for earthly compromise or you will give away the earth compromise, what's available here, the feel good, the look good, the popular on Twitter. You're gonna be just the coolest guy with all your friends and it's gonna be awesome and everyone's gonna agree with you all the time and no one's ever gonna try and cancel you. And you can have all this, but you forfeit the heavenly. Every agreement that you and I enter into, just like Samson, will either cost us the heavenly or cost us the earthly. Agreements. And what we see next is the greatest ploy of the devil. And so many of us, we don't, we don't get it. We live as reactionary Christians instead of responsive Christians. We wait till we're actually in the heat before we start to decide what to do about it. We just react instead of respond. A response means we already have a predetermined path to victory. We already have a predetermined response. We already have a predetermined action that we're going to take and we're going to do. When we come under fire, we have, an, uh, we have a fire escape plan. But, but when we're just living reactionary, we don't have a plan. We don't go into it with a plan. We just show up. Oh, poor girl. And we just have this moment. And so he sees Delilah, and they're in love. Well, he's in lust, and she's in lies. And the Philistines, they hatch a plan to take him out. Oh, Jesus, we just rebuke whatever sickness is going on right now, Father God. We just lift up that poor little girl to you right now, Father, and we ask that you would just come and that you would move a mighty work in her body right now, God, that, that all vomiting, all these things would just cease underneath the mighty name of Jesus, that she would be well as she leaves here, Father God, right now, God. Be with her parents, God, as they're, as they're coming around her and trying to love on her and nurse her, God, and just rule and reign in that situation in the kid's wing right now, Father. We just thank you in advance of what you're doing. We know your heart for this family. We know your heart for this beautiful little girl. So come rule and reign. Heal her. Provide reprieve for the parents. There is no shame. Kids get sick. It happens. But Father, come and just love in that situation. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Eyes back up here. Delilah. And Delilah, this is the greatest trick the devil pulls, and we just don't see it. Again, we live reactionary, not responsive, and it's my goal in agreements that we would begin to live responsive instead of reactionary. I don't want to be found under fire with no plan. Is anybody with me? So here's the plan. Here's what the devil does. Listen to this. Delilah, oh, Samson, oh, you're so big, you're so strong. Look at you. You work out? You go to Temple Fitness? <laughs> you from Wayland? Look at you. So strong. Huh? Ninth Street Dojo? What are you? You got some gold medals? What you doing? You're so strong, Samson. Samson, you're so strong, and your hair is so beautiful, and it just Fabio's around. And you know, Samson, I just, you know, I bet nobody could beat you. You're too good. You're too good. Like, I've heard your stories. You're just the best. You're just the best. You're so sweet, Samson. Like, like seriously, though, like, how could anybody ever subdue you? You know, there's always that little potty lip. Mm. Why are you looking at me like you're taking a selfie? Because you're so handsome. And that's Delilah. And that is exactly what the devil does to all of us. Friends, you want to know how you can spot 
a trap from the devil and not a leading from God. A trap from the devil will always stroke your ego, while a leading from God will always edify you in the spirit. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? The devil will love to stroke your ego. The devil just wants to build you up. You're supposed to be being built up in the Lord, built up in the spirit, built up in the presence of God. You're supposed to be being built up in all of this, and the devil just wants to go, you're so great. You, you're so awesome. Oh my gosh, they don't deserve you, and they cheated on you, and you know what? You should just go and get you some somewhere else. It's Tinder. It's available. There's no consequences. Nobody has to know, and because you're great. You are just the best best. You're so handsome. You're so muscles. You work out. And that is what the devil does. Because the devil's trying to lure you, and he will lure you by your ego. The Holy Spirit will lead you by building you up and edifying you in the Spirit, in the Word of God, leading you into truth. Friends, when your ego is being stroked, more often than not, you are quenching the Spirit. Can I just tell you that ego actually stands for? It's an acronym edging God out. And that's what the devil wants to do. Come here, Samson. How could anybody ever defeat you? And what does Samson do? Samson does what we do when we're slightly, we're not quite there in compromise yet, but we're not quite in set apart. We're in like this middle ground where things are kind of uh, a bit muddy. We're not as far gone as we could be. We're still quite sober in our set apartness, Um, but we could definitely be better than we are. Has anybody ever been there? I've been there a thousand times, okay? I'm not quite as set apart as I could be. I'm not quite as compromised as I'll ever be, but I'm inching my way there. Has anybody ever been there? A little backsliding going on? This is Samson in this moment. He's still sober enough to see kind of what's going on, but he's in lust enough to just play the game. And friends, can I tell you, you will never win in faith by flirting with sin. Can I just tell you that? You will never win in marriage by flirting with sin. You'll never, li- you'll never win in your single season by flirting with sin. You'll never l- win in any area with the Lord. There's no battle you will win by flirting with sin. This is good preaching. I know it's a bit heavy. We're going for some good stuff today. But what happens is this. Samson's like, oh, well, you know, since you asked so nicely and powdered your lip and batted your eyes, uh, now that you mention it, uh, you could just get this rope, but it has to be undyed. Okay, it has to be undried, untreated. It's this very specific, special kind of rope because I'm a Nazarite and it takes a lot to take me down. And if you will tie my hair up and bound me with it, then I'll be powerless. And so what does she do? She believes Samson. He's flirting with sin. She believes and they hatch a plan. And all of a sudden he wakes up and she goes, Samson, those pesky Philistines are on you. She went from, so, I don't know, she went to like a 1940s southern grandma. I don't know. Anyways, so, so Delilah, she's like, they're on you. Careful, Samson, even though she let him in. And they jump on her. And because Samson was still sober enough in his set apartness and not so compromised in his sin, he lied to her and he easily breaks the ropes off, right? And then he goes and shares them where he goes and shows those Philistines where he buried the lion. That's what he does. And she's like, you tricked me. Why are you always lying? You know, Hits him with that one, and he's like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, like, that's what we do here. We lie, (laughs) and, right, and she's like, seriously, though, like, what, what would it take? Like, we're supposed to be doing this life together. I'm supposed to know all of your weaknesses, and this progresses, right, and he tells her another thing, and guess what? The Philistines hatch a plan. I'm moving along for the sake of time. Hatches a plan, does this thing, jumps on him and guess what he does he shows him where he buried their brothers like Samson whoops that again okay and then she is like seriously how can you say this happens three times before this moment he said she says to him how can you say you love me but you won't even tell me how people can kill you girl are you nuts like finna what like that doesn't even make sense but that's the devil right Because Satan actually means accuser. And Satan will always come with accusations. And so often, if we're not living as most set apart lives as we could, suddenly we begin to slip further and further into compromise. If we're not dead set, set apart, being consecrated, living over here as a Nazarite, 
you and I, the second we begin to flirt with sin, the second we begin to be compromised, the second we start making agreements with things in our pain that actively works against what gives us strength, we begin to move closer and closer from consecration to compromised and ultimately separation. And so Samson, he's talking, and he finally tells her, because this is what the devil does, and this is so often what happens to us. James tells us, hey, you need to not only just flee the enemy, you need to resist the enemy, and he will flee. But so often, if we're that point in compromise, we're that point with flirting with sin, we're that point to flirting with death, if we're that point at making agreements with things that the Lord has told us, stay away from, stay faithful to this and away from this, if we're at that point, we start making agreements with things that will take away not only our strength, but our eyes to see truth. Worship team, you can make your way up here. So in this moment, Samson tells her, Samson tells her, he's like, from birth, I'm, I was born a Nazarite. I was born a Nazarite. I was consecrated, set apart for God. And no razor, no blade, no knife, no anything has ever touched my head. If someone was to shave off my locks, I would lose all my strength. Before we get to what happens next, we live in a time and place where deconstruction is running rampant in the church. Where people are just professing I don't feel God as much. I don't see God as much. I'm not having the same experiences that I used to have. I just don't hear him as close as I used to. I just don't understand how I found myself in this place. And suddenly, we find ourselves just trying to completely deconstruct, tear down our faith, tear apart our relationship with Jesus, question everything we've ever believed and everything we've ever experienced. And I would say this, before you deconstruct your relationship with Jesus, perhaps we should examine the agreements that we've made. Before we deconstruct our relationship with Jesus, perhaps we should take time, give God the due diligence of a relationship, of the grace, of the mercy, of the kindness that he has poured out on our lives, the favor. Man, all of us are here, not by happenstance, but by the miraculous, amen. You are a miracle of God. Whole point that you are here in church today, have a relationship with Jesus today, have the ability to worship in this place today. All of this is a miracle. All of this is favor. All of this is God saying, I've made an agreement between God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, that we wanna use you in the earth at such a time as this. You are here on purpose. But so often we get so far down the track, like Samson, and we give the devil what he wants, the truth. We tell him our Achilles heel, and he comes in like a Philistine in the night Not only does he steal from us, but he gouges out our eyes for truth. You see, what's crazy in this moment is Samson fully compromised. He's no longer consecrated. He's fully compromised. And you see, Samson, it says that he falls asleep with his head in Delilah's lap. And I feel like for a lot of us in 2020 and 2021, we spent a lot of time resting in compromised places. I feel like for a lot of us, I feel like for me, I've spent a lot of time resting, being found with my eyes in a lap that is compromised. I've taken rest and I've taken refuge and I thought this looked good. 
the world said this and everybody was affirming this and all of these things it just felt so great and it's just plaguing the church right now we are just resting in compromised laps because we've made agreements little ones and big ones alike that led us from being set apart to being compromised and not only were we compromised then we went from being a Nazarite prince to being a Philistine prisoner these are the bear traps these are the things that just say this is going to feel good this is readily available you're the best you deserve it God would want you to have it they cheated on you this should be your response and it's all of these things and if he can lure us to make agreements with enough of them friends we find ourselves in a place where I think Samson gets it wrong and I'm gonna tell you why I think he gets it wrong Samson's in a place in this moment where he says he woke up he's He's tied, he's subdued, his strength has left him. And he says, my strength has left me and the Lord has left me. See, I think he gets it wrong because we know based off the word of God that God never leaves us nor forsakes us. But how many know often when you're in a compromised place, it feels like the Lord has left you. When you've made decisions that have led to your own self-destruction, it feels like the Lord has left you. It feels like he wants nothing to do with you. You think to yourself, how could he? He was so good. He was so kind. He was so faithful. And here I am squandering everything he ever gave me. And again, we begin to make agreements with lies. Because the Lord didn't leave Samson. Because what happens next is this very next verse. This very next part of the story, literally that portion we read, it ended with his hair began to grow back, which tells me this. Samson's strength wasn't found in his hair. Strength, his, Samson's strength wasn't found in his chiseled features. Samson's strength wasn't found in his bank account. It wasn't found in how many foreskins he collected on the battlefield. Samson's strength wasn't even found in his notoriety. It wasn't that his reputation preceded him that allowed him just to plow through the oncoming opposition and forces against him. No, Samson's strength wasn't found in any of those things because his hair began to grow back. But instead what happens next is at the end of this chapter in Judges 16, 25 through 31, you guys can stand up. What happens next is Samson makes a new agreement. Samson again believes to live set apart. Samson again believes to take up his Nazarite mantle. I feel like today we could hear a message and we could be faced with truth and we could say, you know what, Matt? I felt it. I feel compromised. I don't feel consecrated. I don't feel like I've been living set apart. I feel like I'm distant from God. I feel like I don't hear him as well as I used to. I feel like I'm not in the word as much as I used to. I feel like worship doesn't feel the same. I feel like I'm not having the same relationship with God that I used to. I've got good news for you, amen. There's a better agreement. There's a better agreement. You don't have to make agreements any longer as someone who's called to be set above and make agreements with that which is set above you no longer have to live making agreements with that which is set below you friends you can make a new agreement today and that new agreement isn't with a pastor that new agreement isn't with you that new agreement is with the Lord And it's called the agreement of redemption. Because what happens in the rest of this book in in Judges 16 is this. Samson, his eyes are gone. He's got no vision. The Bible tells us that where there is no vision, people perish. When you have no vision, you have no future. When you have no future, you are doomed to repeat your past. And just like a baby in the womb, Samson is 
bald, helpless. They can't see a thing. And he gets help. Everyone's laughing. The Philistine lords, they're throwing a party. They have their highest trophy, Samson. Samson's chained, Samson's helpless, and he gets helped up. And he just says, Oh Lord God, you see, this is the thing. God never left Samson. Samson left God. The Lord didn't inch away with every agreement. Samson inched away with every agreement. The Lord isn't leaving you with every agreement you make. We are leaving him with every agreement we make that is not above him or about him and for him. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? But Samson, he does what we should all do. Every time we fail, every time we fall, every time we feel like Lord is far from us, this should be our prayer. He said, oh Lord God, please remember me. Please strengthen me only this once, oh God, that I may avenge on the Philistine for my two eyes. And it was at this moment, Samson experiences what I'm going to offer you all to experience right now. There's a hand from heaven that has never rescinded from you, and it's in this moment. It doesn't matter how beaten, how defeated, or how eyeless you are. If you to make an agreement that hand is still reaching out to you doesn't matter how compromised you lived doesn't matter the agreements that you've made doesn't matter what you got into last night what matters is that his hand is still extended and like samson we can lift up a prayer so that's what we're going to do right now we're going to make an agreement with redemption we're not going to make an agreement with compromise we're not going to make an agreement with the enemy we're not going to make an agreement with delilah we're not going to make an agreement with the lies set before our eyes we are going to determine what truth is and that truth is jesus and that truth is going to set us free and we are going to begin to live lives right now once again where the nazarite mantle falls on all of us where we begin to live set apart once again where we are holy pure and consecrated set apart for the Lord once again because what happens after that prayer is what happens in all of our lives when we come home Samson killed more Philistines that day than he did in his entire life in one moment of his strength returning to him of the mantle of the Nazarite falling back on him when God comes and just meets him there in that broken and blind bloodied and abused and chained up in bondage place he extends out to the Lord oh Lord remember me and the Lord remembers him and the Lord falls on him and it's in that moment he returns to doing what God called him and made him and set apart him to do and it was in a moment of agreement with redemption that he did the greatest amount of work for the Lord, for the kingdom of heaven, than he had done his entire life. That's you. And that's me. And we're going to take this as far as we can. And we are going to break off every unrighteous agreement in our lives. And we are going to see a church full of of Nazarites we're not going to be bitten by the snake we're not going to make deals with serpents but we're going to live by the Holy Spirit that guides us amen worship team would you just begin to sing spirit break out as we begin to close service if that's you there's an altar if that's you there's a prayer team if that's you, and you got some chains that you want to leave in this place today, I will be happy to sweep them up with this confetti the rest of the week. So please, lift up your voice. Open up your mouth. Say, Lord, remember me. And once again, live set apart for the one thing that's worth being set apart for. King Jesus. Amen.